First off, I missed you. What's going on? Did you hear what I said? Fine, I kind of missed you too. Thank you. The Phaedrus is the great lyrical masterpiece in the Platonic corpus. It is arguably the most beautiful thing Plato ever produced. The primary themes are love and rhetoric. The three speeches on love are progressively more philosophical and progressively more beautiful. And they provide us with something to think about that never really go out of style. Love has to shut up. You won't let it. No, you won't let it. I'm the one who talked. Okay, mouth shut. Ears open. Ergo. Well, what goes on are the setting of this dialogue, and it's only between two people, between Socrates and Phaedrus, and he wants to know about the nature of love. You really want to know what love is? Yeah. Yes, tell us. More than anything in the world, Ron. Well, it's really quite simple. It's kind of like... As Socrates says, no, I can't do that. I've done something wrong. Scorching noonday. Remember when the, when the sun comes up and it's very hot? Um, the rising of the good, or we're going to move from evil towards some kind of apogee, and then we're going to move towards um, a further elaboration of the good. Also, in this case, heat is connected with the idea of passion, with the idea of emotion. This is the high point of passion, and now as the afternoon waxes and as the sun begins to set, we're going to have a setting of passion, and the decline of passion will be the rise of reason, and the rise of reason will be the articulation of noble love, of real love, of love in the Socratic sense. Afternoon delight. You guys have it, I think. Socrates says, I've just heard from my daimon. Remember that he has a, a daimon in his head? Why is my spider sense going crazy? That tells him only what he ought not to do. Never gives him any other information, just tells him what he ought not to do. And the daimon says, Stay where you are, Socrates. You must stay where you are because you have done something impious. You have done something wrong. You have done something evil. Socrates, you must make amends because the gods have been listening. The gods will not tolerate this sort of slander of love. You sound like a man that knows no holy, honest, uh, faithful, true love. I don't know, Ron. That sounds kind of crazy. Sounds like you have mental problems, man. Yeah, you have mental problems, man. Yeah, it really does. Man. And Socrates says, you're right. Remember what happened to Stesichorus? I suppose that I am going to have to make amends and give a second speech that will articulate the true nature of love. Now, since almost all of you don't know who Stesichorus is and what Stesichorus is, let me clue you in, because once you think about that element here, the whole dialogue begins to make a little more sense. Stesichorus is one of the great lyric poets of Greek literature, and he's well known for having made two speeches about Helen, Helen of Troy, and in the first poem, he said some very unkind, very cruel things, gave her a very harsh evaluation. And as a result, the gods were wrathful, and Stesichorus was blinded. Who's that? Who's that? What you want? Now, let's remember the fact that in this first speech, Socrates has a cloak over his head. He has voluntarily deprived himself of sight. Well, in this last speech that he is going to give, his improved speech on love, Socrates won't be wearing a cloak on his head because it will be analogous to the second speech of Stesichorus, the second speech which tells the truth about love, so he has given back his moral sight, he is no longer plagued by moral blindness, and the problem of impiety is resolved. I can see! I can see! I have I can, I have made! I have no oh, I appreciate this! Oh, this is beautiful! I can't believe it! Thank you! I don't know what to do with love! So what Socrates is going to do is give a second speech, which will be the true encomium on love. And that means that he has to start again from the beginning and chuck out just about everything that was in Lysias' speech because it really can't be salvaged and yet turned into a good poem, uh, into a good speech. A good speech will have to start from scratch. And as Socrates says in a very important line in the, the dialogue, the essence of good speech is telling the truth. There can be no good speech without good content. You have to know what you're talking about before you can make a good speech. And Lysias didn't, and even trying to improve on Lysias leaves you stuck with certain of Lysias' sentiments, certain of Lysias' forms, and the only way to really construct a good speech on love is to go back to, to square one, start from scratch. So that's why he doesn't come through with that speech. It was impious, and it was monstrous, and he feels bad about it. I immediately regret this decision. And he starts out by saying, yes, it's true, love is a kind of madness. Love is a kind of insanity. That sounds kind of crazy. Sounds like you have mental problems, man. Yeah, you have mental problems, man. Yeah, it really does. But 
Do not make the impious mistake of thinking that all insanity is evil. Actually, some insanity is divine and sent by the gods. And there are at least three or four, actually four kinds of insanity that are clearly divine, that are sent from the gods, that are sent as a benefit to human beings, not as a punishment. And the different kinds of uh, uh, madness that are divine and sent by the gods, first of all, prophecy. Whenever someone is divinely inspired and is speaking for the God, they don't understand what they're saying. They don't sit down and do some rational calculation. The gods are inspiring them. They're able to, to speak for the gods. The uh, second kind will be purgation. When we find some way of atoning for our sins, the way in which we are absolved of our sins involves some sort of divine madness, some sort of rite or ritual which allows you to get rid of your sin. He says specifically that lyric poetry, the poetry which expresses powerful in, uh, individual emotions, is always a kind of madness. The lyric poets don't understand what they're talking about, but if they're good at what they do, they are good because they're inspired. So this kind of inspiration is a divine madness, and the fourth kind of divine madness is love. And in that respect, all of us are insane at some point in our life. With any luck, we will be insane all through our lives. But this kind of madness is a blessing. This kind of madness improves and perfects the soul, and it helps you improve and perfect those whom you love. This is not a punishment. This is the greatest gift the gods can bestow upon us. Now, what's very interesting about this third speech is that I said that divine madness was uh, purgation of sin, prophecy, and uh, the kind of influx of the divine. I said it was lyric poetry, and I said it was love itself. Socrates' third speech is all these things. It is divinely inspired, it is lyric poetry, it is about love, he loves Phaedrus and also loves all his fellow men. Socrates is the great instantiation of love in a kind of divine, superhuman sense. <sighs> Boy, that escalated quickly. Now, another way of thinking about the progression in these speeches is that we could say Lysias' first speech is the bronze speech, right? It refers to the bronze part of the soul. That the second speech, or the, you know, the first one produced by Socrates, Socrates' um, you know, middle speech, is the silver speech. It's certainly better than the bronze speech. It has true opinion, if not knowledge. It has um, some sort of sense of honor and sense of superior um, emotion, but it doesn't ever really complete the progress of the soul towards knowledge of love. The final speech that he gives, the encomium on love, one of the greatest speeches in the Western tradition. I don't think it's been improved on as love poetry ever. It's just gorgeous. And it's not about bodies, it's about souls. It's about aspiration towards what's best. I mean, anybody, I mean, if any of the audience has ever been in love, you know that it is some, it's some kind of wrinkle in the fabric of reality. It's not like the tables and chairs that you encounter normally. It does something to you and makes you want to give a blessing, a benediction on the world. It makes you want to improve and perfect the beloved because the beloved is somehow an image of that which is perfect, of that which is worth aspiring to. It somehow justifies your suffering. It somehow makes you feel that all the misery or all the incoherence and all the nonsense in life somehow makes sense. And by improving and perfecting the beloved and doing what you can to make them more divine and godlike, you gratify yourself that much more and also at the same time you improve your own self that much more and make yourself that much more lovable. Afternoon delight. So there is a fine reciprocity of identity creation in the Socratic conception of love that he gives in this third speech. So he gives us this idea of divine madness and says, love is a kind of madness from the gods. And he says, I must give you an image of the soul because Socrates' kind of love is soul love. I mean, it, it's bodily love in the most attenuated sense, in the sense that people have to take up space and all, but it's not primarily concerned with that. And he says, the soul is like a chariot with winged horses. You know Pegasus, the horse with wings? Well, imagine a chariot driven by a charioteer with two horses in front, one black, one white. Now the gods, fortunately for them, have uh, are pure soul. They don't have bodies at all. And they have just two white horses that are easy to control because the white horse is the good horse. It's the horse on the right-hand side. And that takes them up to the top of the universe where they're able to contemplate pure being. They engage in the banquet of the gods where they have contemplation of truth and the form of good and the form of the beautiful and the form of the, of the virtuous. In other words, the soul is a kind of winged thing. It takes us up out of the realm of space and time altogether. This image of the chariot of the soul is what carries us out of space and time into the realm of the forms. Up we go, up the divided line, out of the cave altogether, and we go flying out. And love helps the chariot of the soul take flight. It's so lonely at the top.
Shabbat Olympus. <laughs> okay, Frank, what's next? Now, for regular human beings as opposed to gods, we don't have two white horses. We have a white one and a black one. The white one is docile, well-behaved. It's our silver soul. It's the part of our emotions which are orderly, restrained, just, and docile. On the other hand, we have certain impulses, physical passions, the desire for possession. All the bronze elements in the soul are represented by the black horse. The black horse is very hard to restrain. In other words, getting the, the chariot of the soul to move properly and harmoniously is a question of getting your good emotions hooked up with your bad emotions, or at least your uh, forcible, dominating emotions connected to your other emotions so that the chariot of the soul can move up to the realm of the gods. Those of us who manage to control ourselves and create self-discipline, who create moderation, you, because the chariot, of course, represents the uh, gold part of the soul, the rational part. Well, the gold part is supposed to drive these horses, and it's easy to drive the white horse, but the black horse is a problem. Now, those of us who manage to create moderation and order within the soul can move up to the realm of the gods, and move to what Plato calls uh, to stand on the back of the universe and to see all of reality. It's a lovely image of moving outside of space and time altogether into the soul world. Welcome to the real world. And what happens when we go up there is that if we do that, we are preserved and can live among the gods and contemplate the true forms of good and being and truth for 10,000 years. On the other hand, if we don't manage to restrain ourselves, we don't create self-discipline and moderation and harmony within, the result is, is that we, the horses damage their wings. And these damaged wings fall to earth because they can no longer support themselves and they are embodied as human beings. Is it really so hard to believe? This is the world that you know. The world as it was at the end of the 20th century. You've been living in a dream world. This is the world as it exists today. In other words, the condition of humanity, the human condition, is a state of radical deprivation. We are souls that have somehow been stuck in this tables and chairs world. And this is not where we really belong. And all of our, of our longings for perfection for beauty, for truth, is a distant and fuzzy and inconclusive recollection of what we saw when we were pure souls. In other words, the earth, the world of substance, gets in the way of our recollection. Remember what recollection means from the Mino? It's real knowledge of the ultimate forms. Well, down here, we see, we remember once in a while what we could have been, what we once were. And as a consequence of that, love enters into our life. Whenever we fall in love, what we see in the beloved is not meat moving around. What we see is a memory of some image of some perfect beauty. It's an embodiment of something we saw in an earlier life, at an earlier phase in our spiritual development, before we too became meat. In order to change a human being into this. And Socrates, of course, believing in reincarnation and things like that, holds the view that if people pursue an excellent love, the kind of love which tries to improve the beloved and make them even more like that image of perfect beauty or perfect virtue or perfect truth, then we perfect ourselves and we improve the other. And this is what love really is. It's none of this stuff that Lysias was telling us about gratifying our desires in a rational way. It's not like that at all. What real love is, in Socrates' sense, is an attempt to perfect the other through improving their soul, which is what, incidentally, Socrates is doing with Phaedrus here. That's his idea of love. This instantiates all the things that he is talking about. And after being born three times, and at the end of, of one's life, you're judged and punished or rewarded for a thousand years, and then you come back. So you have ten cycles of birth and death in the cosmic cycle, because it goes around once every ten thousand years. If you have been virtuous in your pursuit of love in those ten thousand years, you may get your wings back and essentially join the angels again, which is where you belong. On the other hand, if you do not, you can fall down the scale of being. And if you pursue a philosophical love, like Socrates does, that is not interested in bodies, but is interested in souls, that is not interested in gratification, but is interested in truth and wisdom and justice and virtue, well then you can only, you only need to go around three times and then you will be absorbed back to the gods directly. The idea is that we are all somehow angels that happen to be in this physical world due to some mistake that happened <laughs> when we were back in heaven. No, I don't believe it. It's not possible. I didn't say it would be easy. I just said it would be the truth. Stop! Let me out! Let me out!